Okay, everybody, this session is recording. We are live. We will refrain from swearing. And uh, I'm very glad that you can be here. My name is Ross Campbell. I'm the founder of Fit Summit. I'll be talking you through this event and have the pleasure of interviewing our keynote guest, Simon Flint, CEO of Evolution Wellness, Sean Tan, director of True Group, and also Emma Barry, um, advisor to some of the biggest and most successful fitness brands in the world. Um, as everyone is joining us now, you're going to be seeing the stage and you can jump across. We have talks happening in this sessions box across the day. We have networking face to face and we also have time at the exhibition for you guys to go in and say hello. Now, the corpus of this one session is to try and find out what's happening at the moment in time with some of the major brands in fitness as they navigate through the COVID-19 crisis. This has been a very challenging time for everybody, but at the same time, of course, we must look optimistically ahead at what can be done to improve our industry in the long run and ensure people are happy and healthy in the years to come. What I want to do initially was just talk you through a little bit about the sessions as well. If you do happen to be stuck in any one place, just hit the refresh and the browser will refresh you back into the zone. I'm going to quickly introduce Simon and then Sean and Emma to basically talk a little bit about what their last four to six weeks has been like. So Simon, if we can start with you, maybe a summary of what the last four to six weeks have been. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thanks to uh, Ross and team for organizing this event uh, so quickly um, and getting everyone onto this platform. I see this uh, thousand plus people, which is which is great. So coming to the, the last four weeks for us, as I'm sure for many, this has been really an extraordinarily steep learning curve. Um, I've been in the industry for 26 years plus and never have I thought that we would face a situation like this, which I'm sure is, is something that everyone feels. Um, so in the first instance, really, the, the learning curve piece is something that has meant every one of us uh, in any position of leadership, uh, of a leadership team, has had to respond to day by day by day because the situation has changed so very fast. Um, and I think that, you know, with our priorities have been in the first instance to do whatever we can uh, to look after, our, firstly, our staff and, of course, our members. We have 7,000 of the former and 400,000 of the latter. So there are lots and lots of people out there who are experiencing similar disturbances, trauma, um, unusual situations, stresses, and the relationship that we have with them is just for one little part of what they're experiencing. So we've just got to make sure that everything they experience with us as a brand and as people is as best it can be. So um, really the, the key point for us has been communications, getting our, our communication strategy right and our execution on point to make sure we're really clear with our staff and with our members as to the direction we're going. I think that's what people need, a clear sense of direction, wh wherever it may be. Sure. Sean? Last four weeks, um, for us, it's been a roller coaster. We have we have 24 clubs over two countries, Singapore and Taiwan. And both started out more or less um, at the same place uh, just after Chinese New Year, end of January, uh, with, with some uh, you know steps being taken, measures like temperature, temperature controls, checks, cleanliness, sanitization. But as uh, time moved on, um, Taiwan more or less remained the same. Um, you know, they, they've never shut down. So up to today, our clubs, our 14 clubs in, in uh, Taiwan have remained open, uh, albeit with some restrictions, uh, face masks and, and some social distancing. Singapore, however, has been a lot more of a roller coaster. Um, we've had, um, towards the end of March, uh, restrictions, you know, like, um, you know, uh, one meter social distancing, 10 persons max in, in a studio, regardless of how big your studio is. And then on the gym floor, 16 square meters per person. You, so you take a total square footage, you divide it by 16 square meters. That gives you the maximum capacity at, at that time. Um, what that has been, um, it's been a roller coaster, a real mix of emotions. And as Simon said, the speed at which we've had to adapt and react to all of this has been phenomenal. Um, but the one thing that we have seen is that um, the team, especially the operations teams, and even the other teams from the membership and from PT, everybody chipped in, and they rallied together. We met every you know uh, uh, measure that that had to be done, and I think that has brought the team together. 
And through this, the, the members have actually seen us put in a lot of effort and um, very pleasantly uh, you know, surprised to see that a lot of members have, have embraced that. They've thanked us for it and they've been a lot more understanding. And that has translated into not as many suspensions as we would have expected, but I'll talk yep. about that a little bit later. Sure. And Em, um, good to join you. I know it's late in, in California, in the US. Thanks very much for being here. Your thoughts, of course, on a very different landscape, but more wider as well. Yeah, look, and hi, everybody. I can see you from all around the world, and it's tremendous to be on. Look, um, if you've been following along, it's day 27 of my badass pull up, so I've kind of been documenting the last month. I actually started in Amsterdam. And at the beginning of the week, everyone was kissing three times and hugging. And by the end of the week, the South had been closed down. Then I went to France and then I got the last flight out of France before the borders in the US sort of started restricting European travel. Um, and then, of course, we've been in a very interesting political environment. It's always interesting just to see what Trump's going to get up and say sort of the next day. And sometimes it's been at odds with what some of the governors have been thinking. So there's been some mixed messaging, to be honest, here in the US. Uh, we've had several stimulus packages come in um, and there's still been a lot of people in, in the health and fitness um, businesses that have been missed in that. So there's a couple, one is around payroll relief and one is around uh, the CARES Act as well. So Ursa have been lobbying really hard, but there, there's definitely some some money missing there in terms of our segment. Look, and then I think energetically it's been really interesting. So. Week one was what the hell just happened? And in the United States, um, the first things to sell out were guns, bullets and toilet paper in that order. So that was sort of week one. Then the reality landed. Then everyone ate the fridge, um, did all their home home stuff, was a little bit excited about it and everyone went live. So at that point, all the Zoom came down. So at 12 o'clock, pretty much every day, it's very sketchy on Zoom because everyone's going live. And there was also a lot of activity around um, salaries, you know, who's on salary, who's let go, who's furloughed, who's um, kept on, what, who goes to a skeleton staff. Um, every day has been a different emotion, to be honest, over here. And there's been a way. So New York has obviously been hit very hard. It's a little bit more um, casual over here in Cali, I would say. Um, and then at the two-week mark, so everyone was closed mid-May, uh, mid-March, sorry. So mid-March it was mandated um, and some some businesses pivoted very quickly within a two-week period. Others kind of ran for the hills and scrambled, but those that have pivoted are now doing quite well, it appears, or, or better than others. People like Barry's, people have jumped on to go fund me if some of their instructors aren't being paid, etc. Online PT is going through the roof. Anyone with a digital platform is doing very well right now. And, uh, and right now we're just, uh, again, we're not quite sure if we're extending till May the 15th been, um, uh, or April rather has been a new April or May, mid-May has been a new date. Others are saying we're going to be open by May 1. So it's it's very mixed. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's what we're up to in, in, in month one at least anyway. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you look over to your right hand side, you'll see a poll being placed at the moment in time. Before we move on to talk about revenue, cost and finance, the poll is how much revenue has your business lost in the past two months? Under 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80 or over 80% are you a zero revenue business. So click on that poll in the next minute or so and uh, we'll come back and loop around with the votes in a little while. Simon, over to you, if you don't mind. Emma talked about this and so does Sean, this reality, this shock to adjustment to reality. How are you coping now technically as a minimal revenue business and how are you planning forward? Well, in the first instance, I think the team has responded tremendously. I mean, I've never been prouder of, of, of our organisation. We've got some really good team players and experienced people, um, but this has really brought out the best of everybody. And the, the first thing that we've done is rally around to protect our workforce. Um, we are practically a zero revenue business at the moment. In fact, we're we're um, utterly minuscule amount of revenue that's coming in from some uh, sponsorship revenue, from some online activity that our Thai team have, have uh, successfully put to market. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we're a zero revenue business at this moment, yet um, our members are highly engaged, 4.6 million views cumulatively of the content we've had online since the 12th of wow. April. Uh, and 
that's a result of, of moving quickly uh, to get really, really good content together, good fitness personalities online, um, and having them broadcast across Facebook Live and Instagram, etc., to keep that connection. Um, but it, the, on the, the back of um, the house, so to speak, we've had to be very quick uh, in, in mitigating our cash outflow. Um, clearly, when there's nothing coming in, we need to, our priority is our staff. So we have to look at our supply chain and we've got to leverage the good relationships we've got to have our suppliers work with us and look to defer payments potentially. Clearly with landlords, that's a huge rent check every month and a, and a big ticket item uh, across the estate. We have 176 leases um, and we've engaged every single one of them. Again, our, our head of leasing and the team, uh, a tremendous job um, in getting onto that and, and connecting with landlords. Most have been very responsive and I would hope that people who are operating smaller studios or smaller businesses out there will get an equally good positive response from their landlords because of course that helps you to carry on it helps you be viable to pay a full rent check sometime uh, down the line so our focus has been really to to stem the bleed if you like and to focus on 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 restricting our cash outflow to protect the frontline staff i mean finally if i could make a point there the a lot of our teams you know we have about seven thousand staff and many of them work for commission for a lot of their their income they may get a base salary and then a, an amount of commission on top and clearly when they're not working or not teaching classes or not not doing their personal training they lose an awful lot of their income in one go so our job is to is to allow allow them to receive as full salary for as long as we possibly can in a zero zero revenue environment and that's why those those measures are absolutely uh, critical and they need to be they need to be fast okay sean i'm mean, obviously you've got your portfolio of clubs as well how and i suppose more recently you've had to come down to a zero revenue business in singapore how are you balancing revenue from singapore from taiwan and obviously minimal revenue from singapore now well we we run different books uh, for both countries and taiwan has been okay so we're we're thankful for that um, to be honest some revenue uh, there's been some revenue drops there but not significant Singapore, very badly hit, simply because we're all shut down. Um, but very similar to what Simon has done, you know, we've had to, to look at how we can um, cut our costs. And significant um, uh, you know, chunk of that would be landlords. Um, and we've been fortunate to, to have had good conversations with landlords and the landlords. I think this also comes with a bit uh, of a push from the Singapore government. Um, they've been on the backs of all the landlords to tell them to pass on things like property tax relief and uh, rebates fully to, to the tenants. But on their own, I think the landlords have been coming forward and they've been offering, you know, uh, rent holidays, waivers, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, and uh, to all of those who are, who are listening, you know, if, if you haven't got a, a, a good deal from the landlords, um, feel free to reach out to, 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 to me or Simon or, you know, we can give you a, a, a few tips on, on how we've engaged the landlords with that. And uh, it's important for them to know that it's got to be a win-win um, and we hope to survive, you know, the, this, this month or so and we want to come back stronger. Um, and that's how we've engaged the landlords. The staff communication has been something else which has been uh, very, very crucial for us. Um, we too work um, with, with a lot of staff. We've got in Singapore, we've got about 500 plus staff um, and a lot of them are commission based as well. So what we've had to do from day one um, is to make sure that we've had very clear and honest communication with the staff to tell them as far as possible, we'd, we'd want to, to make sure that their paychecks are intact. Uh, but I think they also know, and, and the staff have been coming forward to tell us, we understand if we have to take a bit of a cut um, across the board. Um, it can be absolutely candid. Um, everybody took a, a pay cut right at the start. Um, we were preparing for this, so we, we wanted to shore up some cash and now we're seeing those measures, uh, you know, come into play and that's useful. Um, I won't say that that's the only time, you know, we'll have to make cuts. There may be, the, if, if this drags on longer, we may have to, you know, but it's important, I think, to have very candid and honest communication internally and then externally. Um, but uh, I, I would just leave one point, you know, we've had members um, who've been given the option to to suspend their memberships but we've been really pleasantly surprised that many of them have come and they basically said no carry on um, mm -hmm. we want to keep on paying to make sure we have a we have a we have a club to come back to once this is lifted uh, in their minds uh, you know this is not going to be something which is drags on indefinitely 
It might be a four week, six week, eight week period, but they hope to be able to get back into their fitness uh, routines and they want their club to go back to. Thanks, Sean. Emma, I know, of course, that you are consulting with many companies, big and small, especially some of the boutique brands. What are your thoughts and observations on how some of your clients um, are working through this crisis and indeed some of the best practice that perhaps some people can put towards cash flow and revenue, especially in the boutique sector? Yeah, sure. So um, well, I'll just cover off the other guys first. So some of the more clubs, um, sort of mid and upper level, a lot of them didn't drop to zero revenue because they already had a great relationship with their membership and they and people are, in some countries, like I'm thinking of some of my Euro European clients, they actually got guaranteed 70% of their salary anyway. So that was sort of provided for them. So that was taken off the table really early. So there's a lot of countries in Europe, my observation, that's very civilised. So people switched into this new system, got some salary coming in, they're happy to keep paying that through the chain, which has sort of taken the you know taken the pressure off the clubs at some level, which has been really nice. Um, then as we went further into it, and a couple of people that I work for were first movers in this space, they then gave the range of options. So it's really important as a, as a, as a leader, as a club owner, to actually be one step ahead of what your membership might be thinking about. So they're going to be looking at their dollars, they're going to be looking at their options, they're going to be looking at how well are you serving them and, and, and are you helping them live through this, this challenging time. So... Um, you know, I've seen some clubs offer three or four options. So one might be, hey, do you want to keep paying? And we'll pay that through to staff that we're keeping and we'll keep serving you, you know, whatever that looks like. Maybe we have a reduced offering. Maybe we have a digital offering or there's a smaller set of services that we can do. Or maybe we freeze or maybe, you know, maybe you have that option to actually cancel altogether. So just being really upfront and transparent around that um, has really worked well. And some of the businesses I'm working with have literally said 40% have actually decided to stay on fully paying and then a large chunk of them actually paying something. So because they're not so under stress, so they're happy to pay that through. So I think that's really um, that's really cool. Boutiques are harder hit and I'd say they're the hardest hit uh, in the segment because it's pay-go model. So hand to mouth, um, so people are definitely shifting to GoFundMe. They're definitely shifting to live. They're Got a beautiful note from, for example, Carrie from Fitting Room in New York, just an absolute leader in the space. Beautiful, personalised email. Hey, guys, we're with you through this, whatever you need. We're keeping our staff on. If you'd like to donate a little something, please be assured it will be paid through to staff. And, you know, I, I get the feeling that a lot of people are going to pay through because they love that trainer, they give them health and happiness, and, and they'll do that through. Others are switching into a model where they film they film material and then they're beginning to sell it. I'm thinking of people like Barry's have set up a whole online suite now, Y7, for example, where you might pay, I think your example is like $16 a month or something. It's not much, but it's something and it's, you know, it's going to be paid through. Everyone's running reduced schedules. So, you know, you're trying to keep less, less people on there, but a lot of them have actually whipped away to like, you know, 96 or 97 percent of their staff have been, you know, furloughed or, you know, just not with the company right now. So that's um, that's kind of where that's at. And then a lot of people um, are actually giving the, the equipment away, renting the equipment out. So, hey, we're not going to be using the bikes till we open again. Why don't you come and rent the bike? Or And I know a lot of the clubs are renting out equipment as well um, to keep that live going because there's only so much you can do with two cans. Sure. So just some ideas that you're doing. Thanks for that, Em. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we flick back to the poll, coming back to the, the kind of theme of this one segment being revenue, cost and finance, you'll see that the vast majority of people have lost 40% and above of their revenue in the past two months. So, um, of course, this is a, I suppose, a very telling sign and, of course, something that we're all going through. Simon, let me pull you back in now. We're moving from revenue and cost and finance, communication. And of course, it's so important to communicate. How have you managed to kind of plan your internal communications and then from gelling those together, how do you plan and strategize for your external communications? So we, we learned quite quickly in the first instance that despite having a regular communication uh, with this kind of Monday memo to, to let people know where we were, how many, this is what before things were closed down, we were tracking how many cases there were, um, what was happening on a, a regional scale. Of course, again, six different countries, things happen at different times. Um, but we had a Monday memo kind of uh, update to our staff to let people know where they stood and what we were doing to step up our measures. So that started with the, uh, you know, the hand sanitizers at the front door. We then instituted 
uh, a wipe down of the door handle every couple of hours, all of the fridge handles in the pantry and stepped it up and up. Why were we doing that? Well, that was first of all, to let the staff know that we were firstly aware of the changing seriousness of the situation. Secondly, putting uh, care and consideration first, but being very proactive in communicating. But despite us doing that, we learned that we needed to be even more communicative. So some of our staff had said, um, we, we heard about a case in a certain club, can we have more information? So then we started to put town halls in, into place. So I have a face-to-face -face with social distancing, I might add. So we had you know, chairs spread out in a, in a reasonably large room to have the opportunity for question and answer and just to let people know that we were um, going to consider every measure with safety as, as the paramount uh, thing on our mind. Um, I, I think then from moving into the member space, it was really important that we were proactive in letting people know the direction of travel as well. Um, and the, our marketing teams and communications guys have been absolutely fantastic working around the clock as well, preparing across six different brands, different brand graphics to make sure a number of scenarios were prepared for. Um, so in anticipating what may happen next, we will prepare communications for different eventualities. And then as that eventuality came around, those communications were, were triggered. And I, I think the one key learning, which was critical and it's something that is useful in, in the way we look at this going forward is um, to think about the consequence and the unintended consequence from the, the member perspective. Uh, in looking at some of the online activity, I think that some mistakes were made where uh, the corporate wasn't necessarily seeing things from the member perspective enough and not quite understanding how the member felt. Um, so the need to put empathy first, paraphrase what the member was saying, perhaps on social media as, as a demonstration that you've heard, and then a very clearly articulated piece to follow is important. And that, what we say um, in Evolution Wellness is, is that a, a good communication is one that doesn't invite much discourse. So it's one that's clear and succinct and kind of almost as, as, uh, as finite as can be. So it puts a full stop at the end of it that a decision's been made and, and this is why we're going in this direction. And then it stops that kind of uncomfortable banter that can sometimes happen in social media because you can't please everyone. Um, you know, sometimes when we close down, members say, oh, thank you for looking after us and putting us first. And others say, what's happened? I was, I was coming at nine o'clock tonight. Please stay open. Yeah. To so, you know, we've got to consider the full spectrum, but you've got to do what's right and be on the right side of history when it comes down to it. Thanks, Simon. Emma, I'll pull you in first and then we'll wrap up with Sean in this topic. So communication to internally, of course, to your staff to keep them motivated and enthused. But of course, then how do you manage to keep that optimism to your customers and members? Yeah, so I think the people that are doing it best are one hundred percent transparent. They just um, they they know that change is coming, that we're going to go through this together. But keeping it very positive, very professional, and uh, consistent. So um, you know the best leaders are just coming in, and they're they're always oxygen for their team. And I think that's that's really that's the role of a leader is to see a better way and to really guide people through to that better way. The other thing is to reallocate the new workflow. So there is new stuff that needs to be done. Now, we have to keep busy in these times because that's when you, you start becoming undone when you don't know what you're doing. So to give purpose to the new role. So, hey, guys, we're all going this way. Now we're on a bit of a sprint. Here's what really matters to the business and let's go. And that's when you see people hook into it and, and really go for it. And then I think the other thing is just be cognizant. You want to keep it uplifted. You want to do that. But everyone's going to have their own process around this. They're all dealing with a lot of stuff in a very unusual environment. I'm used to working at home, most people aren't, and it's just shocking to me how caught out people have felt around that, but just expect the full rainbow of emotions and that people will need different things on the way through. And then probably the last thing is just galvanise the team around the broader services. So this is a wonderful time to be, hey, and here's our nutritionalist, and they're going to be coming into the fold and really teaching us all. Here's our behavioural change person. Here's our personal training. So I'm seeing people really get to know each other in a deeper way because we've had this forced pause. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for that, Emma. Um, Sean? I think the one thing that um, that has uh, that we've learned um, is I've said it just now: honest communication, um, whether it relates to internal comms or, or to the members. Um, for us, you know, we we decided very early on that it's okay for us to show or vulnerability or the fact that we don't know, um, you know, everything. We don't have a crystal ball. Yes, very often everybody will look towards you. I mean, if, if you're if you're the top of the organization, they're all going to look to you to, for leadership. 
But, you know, as they say, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Um, we don't know very often, you know, much better than, than anybody else around us. But yet we've got to make certain leadership decisions. So it's fine if we tell the staff and we say, we don't know. But from what we've read and, and from what we can gather from all the different, uh, you know, news sources and what the doctors are saying, the hospitals are saying and what we're other countries are experiencing, this is what we think needs to be done. And in a way, when, when, you're, when you're honest with that communication, there's a certain amount of forgiveness that your staff, as well as members, will, will give to you. So you can be wrong, and that's all right. They won't crucify you thereafter. Um, and they will actually thank you and appreciate you for that. Um, that communication aspect, I think, is, is, it was very, very important, certainly before we were, we were shut down in, in, in Singapore. And um, I think that quick prompt communication was, was key to making sure that we had all those safety measures and, and all that social distancing measures put up um, very, very quickly on. But now that we're all in shutdown, I think that communication to the staff is, is even more key, even more critical. And um, for, for us, what we're doing is it's, it's, um, it's a combination. It's a lot of stuff that we send out via WhatsApp and all, but we employ a lot of Zoom. Um, a lot of video face-to-face -face technology. So we want to still be able to see our staff. We want to, we don't know. I mean, sometimes we don't know whether they're, they're staying alone. Um, four weeks is a long time to spend alone, you know, and it affects one's mental health. So we just want to make sure that the team leaders, our department heads, you're speaking to every single one of your staff, finding out how they are. It need not necessarily be work-related. It could be something as simple as how are you doing for food? You know, uh, have you got Wi-Fi at home? Are you, are you are you watching TV? Are you keeping up with the news? That sort of thing to show them that you care. And then also, as we as we you know we engage with things like you know uh, challenges amongst the staff members, we try to put them on social media. The members can also see that we're we're still trying to keep everybody engaged and busy. Of course, that's on top of all the online offerings, but. That communication, both internal and external, is even more important, and we really need to put a lot of focus on that during this critical time when we're all at home. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Of course, everyone's talking now, ladies and gents, about reopening, relaunching their business uh, when the restrictions get lifted. And of course, there are a lot of unknowns about when that timeline will be. But what is perhaps known as what operators can do in the background, what businesses can do in the background to plan for a successful reopening or, or relaunch. So I suppose tying in two different areas, Simon, one would be what's happening with you in terms of strategizing reopening and, and relaunching some parts of the business and obviously planning for that. How are you innovating behind the scenes to make sure that you are building the business up stronger. We'll exclude digital fitness. We'll come back to digital offerings at a later point, but what are your reopening strategies and thoughts? And then how are you innovating non-digitally? Well, to be very frank, we, we are using this opportunity, which could go for weeks and weeks really, um, to build what we term internally as Evolution Wellness 2.0. So when we think about innovation and strategic direction, Every business needs to grow and to, to shift its direction to find its optimal path for growth and, and value creation. And what we found in an ironic sense, I suppose, is that whilst we've had this time to work from home and to think, we and, and now that the business as usual is not cranking away, creating all of that noise and daily activity, we actually have time to turn our attention to other things. And we've collected all of this to, into what we call EW 2.0. So we, we, something we're just starting on mind mapping out where we should go but that involves the whole organization structure uh, our approach to marketing what percentage should we be spending above the line and in digital and on traditional tactical marketing so we're scrutinizing just about everything in the organization and using the opportunity to return to what will be a new normal we don't know what that yep. new normal will be um, and as we go on the shift in what that might be is probably going to be more and more so in terms of how we, we need to think about it, in the first instance, we've got to have our staff feeling really confident um, about returning back. If, if it's Hong Kong and we open in a couple of weeks time, the hiatus hasn't been so long, so it's probably not as much of an impact. But if it's Malaysia and we open in another six weeks, say for example, that'll be 10, 11 weeks out of the game and lots can change. Let me give you a little bit of insight. In our buildings, 
where we have aircon on during the day and off during the night, buildings kind of breathe and they have this ebb and flow. But now that they're, they're hot and humid all day long, floors start to come up, surfaces start to delaminate, equipment can start to take on uh, some effective moisture and oxidization, MCB boards can be affected, water in hot water systems and swimming pools needs attention. So there's a whole lot of health and safety issues that need to be dealt with by maintenance individuals, by health and safety people to make sure we've got that looked after. Then we have to let the staff know that it's safe to come back and we've optimized and sanitized the, the, the space. Then once the staff are behind that, they can represent that message to our members that we've done our homework, we've really doubled down to make sure that when you come back, our clubs are in the best possible shape they can be. With things like social distancing and, and measures like that, we don't know yet how that's going to play out in every market, but we're aware that that's going to be one of the considerations. So we have our, our guys are now working on the AutoCAD plans, looking at what it would mean if social distancing was X or if it was Y. Um, we had to get special permission for one of our, uh, our staff to go into the office the other day, which is under lockdown, to go and access a lot of files for that purpose. So it's that kind of thing that we're um, that we're working on. And it, I, I think one very big thing, if I could just fit it in, is this opportunity for learning and development. We've um, Every team around the region, again, six different countries, has got all of its staff working really hard online on self-development courses. Some of them are internal courses that we have. Um, and there's a nice little graphic. Um, I don't know if there's an opportunity to share, but it's about choosing your attitude to COVID-19, whether you stay in the, the fear zone or whether you move into the learning zone or, and then expand into the growth zone. So that when you look back on this time, weeks and months out of action and in a different place, you can look back and say, well, at least I did this and I did that. This is what I achieved during that time. And we're hoping that all of our staff can respond in that way. And what we're seeing so far is mind blowing. Really impressive with the way everyone's stepping up. Thanks, Simon. We've got a couple of graphics that we'll share directly after this session with everybody via email. Um, there was a small hiccup earlier on, folks, as you might have realised, when the main stage didn't click on, and that's why we're in sessions. But I'll, I'll forward those slides on after this. Um, Sean, a little touch as well about yourself. Um, thoughts about reopening Singapore? What's going to be changing in terms of how you handle the club and what are you doing behind the scenes to try and keep everything productive and efficient? Um, I think when we're talking about a reopening, I, I, I don't think that uh, we foresee the reopening to be what it was like before COVID-19. It's probably going to be a phased opening. Um, so in Singapore, we see opening with some of uh, a lot of the restrictions that were just in place before we were shut down. So things like social distancing, um, capacity controls, all that will come back in. Uh, and, and the good thing is we went through that before we were shut down. So the teams are ready to put that into place. Um, we have, of course, there's going to be still a lot of emphasis on cleanliness and sanitization. It remains to be seen. I think what has changed um, from then until now, um, there's a lot of literature right now um, about how potentially, um, you know, uh, activity like running and cycling, where you're breathing hard, you're, you're you know, that you have, uh, I guess, an enhanced risk of spreading. So when people come back in, will that manifest or, or you know, change? And uh, will people be asking uh, the clubs whether or not it will be masking up time when people come back in? Are there going to be measures such as that? We don't know. Um, but certainly behind the scenes, um, we have a lot of draw plans. So different draw plans that are, are, are being made to, to cater for different situations. Um, you know, the, the, I think the full extent of the plans will have to in, include some digital and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, like you said, Ross, you know, um, whether or not um, we, you know, there will be a change in the way fitness is consumed and practiced by everyone. Um, I don't think we, my personal view, I don't think we'll see uh, a pivot entirely to, to, to digital. I think physical, uh, you know, going to the clubs and still working out and going for group exercise classes, that is still going to be the normal, but they're going to be, there's going to be different um, changes to how that is practiced and manifested in different clubs. But I think um, certainly for us, um, digital offerings will be part of the mainstay. You know, we have to look at how we can offer that. I think the members will, will start to expect that. But I think the challenge that, will, that we, we face, and uh, I know some other brands also face the same thing, is 
How do you actually get meaningful revenue out of that online or digital offering? Because we were all scrambling. Many, most of us were not prepared for this when, 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 uh, when, when the virus hit. So we scrambled to put a lot of stuff online. Uh, we weren't prepared. And uh, because of that, we were offering it free. So when members are now used to receiving something free, how do you that con convert that into then a paid subscription? That's, I think, a whole different discussion. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Let me just uh, let me just pause everyone here. You go back into the poll section, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, there's a couple of polls there. The first one is more of a funny one, but the second one: Are you now investing in digital offering solutions for your members or clients? Are you now investing in digital offering solutions for your members or clients? No, I am not. Yes, but I always have. Or yes, I am now. If you can click on that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll come back and Emma, we'll come back to that poll in a, in a few minutes. But Emma, if I could lead you into the digital fitness area at this moment in time, like Sean said and Simon alluded to, it's quite new for a lot of people and we've kind of been thrust into this. What are your reflections at the moment on digital fitness within the kind of the, the current landscape and how you see that evolving in the future? Right. Well, first of all, it's obviously a seminal moment for digital. And I, I believe this is accelerated. It's been written about extensively in, in many of the publications, but it's accelerated the digital conversation. Is it coming? Absolutely, it's coming and it's here. And I, you'd be surprised how many people two months ago are still debating about, is this really a thing? Yes, it's a thing and it's here. So I think it's going to serve the greater ecosystem. You know, I'm with Sean. I take his, his comments as well. We're still going to love working out together. And we're going to like sometimes working out on our own at home, on vacation, kids are sick, whatever. So think of it as the greater ecosystem. I think that's the world that we're stepping into. Now, we know that there have been many, there's been an uplift in many of the businesses. So if you look at Peloton, Echelon, Mirror, Tonal, Hydro, Fight Camp, anything that was already set up on that platform, they're enjoying threefold, fourfold, fivefold growth right now. Um, uh, we're also seeing, you know, the MyZone Challenge. I know a bunch of uh, the names that are uh, sort of flowing through the comments here are on that, and that's been like a global initiative that's been really great just to keep people moving at home. I'm looking at the Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth app. Um, he's the number two app. Thank you very much, Owen Bowling, um, in Australia at the moment, and he's, you know, obviously just pumping loads of, of cash into that right now to get up there and offering free stuff. Um, Lesmos on Demand, I just want to give a little shout out to them because they've just done some terrific work in terms of they've cracked 10 million views, they're in over 100 countries now, so a lot of this stuff has absolutely exploded. And a lot of people are providing free right now, and that's really, as someone's mentioned in the comments just here, it's getting people over this familiarity. When we think about something that we're a bit fearful of, we don't tend to approach it, but now everyone's been forced into this new way of, of operating. They're like, oh, it's not so bad. So I think it's got everyone used to it, and it, it's definitely a part of the solution. And it'll be a full solution for a small subset of people, but it will be part of the greater ecosystem. Um, we've been invested in, I'm thinking of Basic Fit now, who I do a bit of work with um, out of Amsterdam. So we they built a, a, um, a digital platform two years ago, and of course that has really put us in good stead to, to serve these times now. Um, what else is happening? Gym Pass, um, Soul Cycles on Syria. So Gym Pass, for example, has got Swift. It's got some of the boutiques that are actually going through that platform now because they saw a need for that and they they pivoted quickly and, and provided that. Soul Cycles on Syria, XM, Planet Fitness and iFit, um, Y7, Lit, all these guys are going live. Equinox, Soul Cycle have now hooked up with Barris. You know, they're up there now. Um, blocks now providing TV in London. So a lot of people are hooking up with partnerships, and I think partnerships will be the future as well. Um, and this is also happening for virtual trainings. In the past, it was like you can only do it face-to-face. -face. Now people are like, no, we have to do it on yeah, here, and, and we're reaching into more blended learning models, which I think are great. There's a lot of stuff you and I don't need to be face-to-face -face for if it's just theory, yeah. but when we come together, that perhaps you can focus your learning more around those things. So we're seeing all of that, and I think the biggest moment around this actually doesn't have to do with fitness right now. It's what Lady Gaga is planning for this weekend, and that's the uh, the One World Together at Home a concert, which is basically Live Aid today. So I look at that, and I think that's going to become a little bit more of our world. All the streaming wars are going to become sort of part of the new ecosystem for fitness um, that will reach many, many people. And pro probably just my closing comment on that would be the barrier of location, I believe, doesn't exist anymore because okay. now... 
you know, here we are across how many countries in the feed, you know, so um, the, the face to face stuff is local, but I think digitally we can now be everywhere. And I think we've all kind of arrived at that moment together, um, somewhat forced upon us. Thanks, Emma. Simon, if you could just quickly share with us a couple of minutes about how you've moved into digital or how you're moving, pivoting is a terrible word we're, we're now all using, but how are you pivoting into digital? And then we'll come back to Sean and then I think we've got uh, maybe five, ten minutes left. So Simon, your thoughts on this new digital era? Hi, Ross. <clears throat> You've frozen on my screen, so I'm just going to check you can hear me first. Gotcha. Go on in there. Yeah, okay. Um, so we just recently did a survey uh, to, to try to understand, you know, evolution wellness is not a not a, uh, an expert in the digital space as yet, but we're going to have to be very quickly um, if we're to play the appropriate part. So we, we surveyed our members recently uh, to find out what they were doing at home, um, what kind of workouts they were doing, were they staying through till the end, uh, what were they watching it on, for example. We found, uh, in, certainly in the Malaysia poll, and I, a quick shout out to Atlanta for pulling this together quickly. Um, less than 50% are actually watching it on their mobile. I thought the number may be higher than that. So others are looking at iPads or laptops or even uh, mirroring to TV. So that, that tells us that um, there's a certain interest to take the effort to, to do that and put it across multiple devices. But I suppose it also tells you that production values have got to be pretty good if people are gonna start mirroring those things onto TV, if they're gonna be repeatable. So I think anybody, particularly Emma, who's an expert in the space, I'm sure that, that um, she would say that production values are particularly important for your online content. It can't just be a random mobile phone shot and expect people, certainly if they're going to pay for it. And, and if it doesn't necessarily mean, though, and again, this is just my, my personal view from what I've learned in a short space of time, it doesn't necessarily mean that something has to be super glossy studio produced if the instructor has an edge and a kind of connection with the audience. I think perhaps that's another way. So great production values and or a really good connection uh, through the instructor and the, the quality of their engagement with the audience. Um, I'll just give you a quick interesting stats for the, the people who've logged on uh, from that same survey. 42% of the respondents said they, they don't mind uh, what they do when they return back to the gym, they just want to get back. Um, so there's a big keenness there for a lot of people to come back even though they're working out at home. We know that 38% of our members, the number one thing that they get from working out in their gym environment is their tribe. And that's even in a full service gym with the full options. Boutique people, they go there because of that tribe connection. So the, the physical contact and the human to human is not gonna be replaced entirely by digital, but they certainly work together. If I can't make it into a club, now that I've, I've got used to clicking a screen on and getting a workout done, maybe I'll get one extra workout in the week. I'm not going to make it to, the, to the, uh, the, the venue today, but I'm now accustomed to doing a digital one. So it's, it's certainly, uh, certainly complimentary. Um, another quick one, 47% of the same people said they got creative with items around the house using brooms, water bottles. Um, I thought about using my cat because he's very heavy, seven kilos, but he doesn't enjoy that particular approach. But it's really interesting. People are, are really thinking about what they can do at home. I read this morning that dumbbells are the new toilet roll. Not in the way that you may think, but in terms of people rushing to buy them. That was a quote from the, this morning's UK newspaper. So it's, it's happening, but I think that it's going to be complementary and not replacing. Thanks. Um, before we go on to Sean for a minute, uh, the poll is in on are you investing in digital offerings and solutions? Uh, there is over 75% are saying yes. They are either investing now for the first time or already are. Only 17% actually are not investing. Sean, one minute, if you don't mind, just a quick recap on what you're doing digitally in under 60 seconds, please. Um, we've had to, to put some of our workouts online and stream it as well, but we're not the experts, to be honest. For us, it's really a stopgap measure to keep the members engaged until such time that we reopen. Um, we were not equipped, we were not prepared to do this in, in, in the best way possible. But I think we will learn from this when we reopen. I think looking at digital as one of the mainstays, one of the, the products that we will offer is going to be important for us as well. But how we actually churn that out and deliver that, that's going to be a, a slightly different uh, uh, issue that we will look at in depth once we reopen. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the last topic, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have a quick 60 second shout in terms of the outlook for the future 
industry. What do people think is going to happen? Consolidation, new market players, what's going to change? Uh, Emma, I'll start with you. If you can give us a quick fire idea of what tomorrow's landscape will look like. Great. Well, exactly what you say. There will be consolidation. There'll be some uh, M&A activity. Uh, some of us won't make it, unfortunately, but um, there'll be a new balance of power. I think digital will definitely come into the equation. It won't be the only thing, but it will be as well as. Um, so, and also hyper-personalization. So, I think everything that's in technology, I mean, if you look at AI and all the machine learning now, we're going to be get much closer to delivering to my preferences, to your preferences, to all of our preferences. Um, and as I mentioned before, I think the streaming wars that we're watching in entertainment, you know, we, we are a part of that. And then what I'd really say is, um, and Casey Conrad brought this up uh, earlier in the week, anyone who's 18 to 60 years old sitting at home, scared stiff that they're going to get the virus, is a person who needs our industry right now because we can give immunity, we can give mental, uh, mental health, physical health, spiritual health, emotional health. We are that place and the time has never been keener than now to see that uh, and as a health thing, not just the six pack and how many burpees can you do in a minute. It's about health. How immune am I to, you know, to the world? Um, so I think those are some things to look forward to. Uh, Sean, the same question to you. Definitely consolidation. Um, I think as, as, as the you know, time goes on, we'll see more and more people uh, unfortunately drop off uh, and fall along the way, but the strongest will survive. And um, I think, you know, even for us uh, as a big box, uh, you know, we're asking ourselves some questions as to whether or not that big box model should, ought to be tweaked uh, once we open uh, again. Uh, you know, do, should we be a little bit more nimble? Should something like this happen again? Um, touch wood, but, you know, that would better prepare us perhaps. So, or whether we go small, uh, being big and taking up a, a big amount of space in a, in a shopping mall has its advantages because you do have bargaining power with the landlords. And, you know, so there are pros and cons on both sides. Uh, so I think that's a, you know, there's a lot of thinking to, 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 to be done. But certainly consolidation is something which we foresee happening and I think it will happen. Thanks. Uh, Simon, some closing thoughts from yourself? I echo what's been said, really. It would seem logical that some consolidation would take place. And I think that if, if uh, <clears throat> any given operator has been uh, a little bit weak or, or on the edge, let's say, before COVID-19 happened, then they would likely find it the very hardest to, to come back from this. Um, but I suppose what I would say is, and I would encourage everyone out there who's a fitness enthusiast, and you know, I can see the scrolls of people writing how passionate they are about what it is that they do, I would encourage everybody to hold on to what you charge. Charge a fair price for the product that you have, because I think this time, and I really hope this time, that the, the public will see what a valuable service that we provide and that our membership subscriptions and our price per class are extraordinarily reasonable in the greater scheme of things in terms of what someone gets out of it. You know, Emma's talk about being a, a, you know, an immunity booster and just for general health. What we do is incredibly valuable. So please, everybody, hold on to the value that you have. Don't discount your prices. Be passionate about the benefits of your product and stick with it. And I wish everybody well. Thanks, Simon. I know there's been a few questions that have been put in. I think we've actually answered quite a few of those to do with the future of online classes, the future of membership engagement. So hopefully, ladies and gentlemen, we've tried to wind our way through a number of topics in the past hour, um, from finance to revenue to communication, uh, of course, to strategy, to reopenings, and then the outlook for tomorrow's industry. I want to take this chance to thank Simon, Sean, and Emma for all of their thoughts. Uh, we will be recording this session, as you will see, and you will get those recordings directly afterwards. Um, email to you. Apologies for the small confusion at the start. As I mentioned, for one, for some reason, the stage wasn't broadcasting. We had to shuffle into the session stage. In terms of what to focus on next, well, the next sessions will start at 3.30 in approximately 15 minutes. And you've got four choices between fitness, wellness, online and sales and marketing. You are free to come in and out of those to talk if you want to. They are open discussions. And also the exhibition is live, as you see, and so is the networking. So we encourage you to make the most of the remaining um, 75 minutes or so that are left in the event. I want to thank all of our sponsors. I think they are now part of this event, part of the exhibition. Our goal with this event was always to make sure people had the chance to connect and, and get involved. So if you want to do that, 
please leave now. Thank you very much for your time. I'll invite Sean, Emma, and Simon to leave, and I'll see you all in 15 minutes in the session. Thanks very much for your time and wishing you all good speed. Take Thank care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You, Bye. Thanks, Rob.